سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صلوات من أكبر We follow a mazhab which is based on the path of Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt means members of a family, members of a household, which was the household of the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is a family which, in the words of Imam Hussain himself, where he says, we are from Ahl Bayt al Nubuwa wa Ma'din al Risala wa Mukhtalif al Malaika. We are from the house of the Prophethood. We are the source of Risalat. And my house is the house where the Malaika used to descend and ascend. This is where the revelation used to come down. And so for us, you know, indeed it's a blessed. Uh, three days that we celebrate the Viladat. Yesterday we celebrated of Imam Hussain alayhi salam and this evening we are celebrating the anniversary of the Viladat of Abbas bin Ali alayhi salatu wa salam. Although these occasions took place years apart, but the Viladat of Hussain on third Shaban Wiladat of Abbas on 4th Shaban is actually a symbolic, you know, sign of the bond in Silatul Rahm between the two brothers. And that is the essence of family life. And it is with this, you know, perspective in mind that I chose to talk about family life, especially in in relation to the roles and duties of the husband and wife. You know, we talk about the Ahlul Bayt, at least I can say, you know, whenever the opportunity comes. But there is also time when we have to talk about our own issues and link it with the examples from the Ahlul Bayt. That is the purpose of this member. You know, sometimes we get all different kinds of reaction some people like one kind of medley, so mahfil, others like the others. When I get negative response from both sides, I realize I'm on the right path. Because then we have to make sure we fulfill our duty. And that is the whole reason why I chose these three nights, you know, for this topic, because it's a serious issue. It is an issue which affects the community. You know, a person in my position, I see things. I hear about it. I hear complaints about it. Many times the complaints are misplaced. You know, everything is put at the door of the Jamaat or the Mihrab or the member and the Madrasa, whereas the problem is all in the family. And that is where we have to talk about these issues. And of course, we will try as much as we can you know, to bring in the example from the seerah of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi wa salatu wa salam. Salawat wa nekbara. Since tonight is the continuation of the theme which I started yesterday, let me summarize that so that we can move forward. Last night, basically, we concentrated on this ayat from Surah An-Nisa, ayat number 34 where Islam has assigned the position of leadership within the family context to the husband. There is no second opinion there. Ar-Rijal qawwamuna ala nisa Surah An-Nisa at number 34. And in that context, it is the husband who has been made, you know, qayyim for the wife. And this position is actually based on an almost obvious sociological principle of leadership. We talked about it in more detail yesterday that you can't have any social unit, large or small, where you don't have somebody who has been assigned the duty or leadership, you know, uh, function there. 
And I quoted this statement from Amir al-Mu'minin about the society. Let me add one more from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That you cannot have a functional social unit, big or small, without a leader. He says uh, the, the, the hadith that we have, Shias and Sunnis, quote this both, is a kharaja thalatha fi safar. If three of you travel together in a journey, فَلَيُؤَمِّرُوا أَحَدَكُمْ before you start your journey, decide among the three of you who is going to be the leader. Because if everybody is leader, you know when you have many cooks, what happens? So even the Prophet says, even if three of you are traveling, decide that if we reach to a point, you know, where we have to make a decision and there is disagreement, one person will make the final decision. So this is how we realize that when we talk about leadership, this is an important position as far as any social unit, big or small, is concerned. And the family unit is not exempted from it. The difference that we have, of course, this was emphasized last night, that the position of the husband as the head of the family or the leader of the family is a position of duty and responsibility. It is not a status of privilege and honor. It is, you know, the duty that a person has to fulfill. And why has this difference come in? You know, the dis difference has come in because of the second sentence in that ayat, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given advantages to some which is different from the other. And we talked about you know, the husband and then the wife. Especially the biological, you know, advantage, if I may call it, given to the wife as a mother. And the responsibilities and the burden that we, which comes from it, that this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would like to lessen that burden from the wife. And therefore, the leadership position coming with some duties have been put on the uh, husband. And what is one of the main important duties? And this is where we come to the another uh, statement from that same ayat. وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ It is the duty of the husband as the leader of the family to provide for the wife and the children. It is not the duty of the wife or the mother, you know, to provide. It is not haram, but the duty is on the husband and not on the wife. Salawat from the Iqbal. Let us now go on to a point of which I wanted to make last night and I didn't have time. When we talk about this position of leadership from the uh, sociological point of view, they talk about three types or three techniques of leadership. One is known as the authoritarian leadership where a person just backs the decision and others don't have any role in that decision making it is the authority that's it other is the democratic form of leadership where the leader is there but he gets the people involved with him consults them and actually guides them eventually to what he thinks to be the wise decision and so the decision would be his at the end but with consultation of the people in a way they buy into that idea. And then we have a third form the, the sociologists talk about where they say the laissez-faire uh, kind of leadership where the leaders, you know, li li leaves everything to the people, which is not really a leadership anyway. And so the question comes up, and of course sometimes, you know, they have studies showing that in certain situations authoritative leadership is required not all the time but sometimes and this is where the question comes up that now that Islam has given the position of leadership to the husband within the family context what kind of a leader should you be authoritarian or democratic 
Or you leave it everything to the wife, for example, and the children. Let, let them do whatever they want. Of course, Islam will prefer the second of the three options that we talked about. Where a leader actually, you know, basically consults and guides the family so that they can come with the consensus to the right decision. Sometimes the consensus would not be there and so the leader has to make the final, you know, uh, say in that matter. And this is where we talk about the issue of consultation and guiding technique that a leader has to adapt. Let me um, give you an example from the um, personality of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. Our Prophet was a Prophet, a Nabi and a Rasul. What is his status vis-a-vis -vis the Ummah? Quran is very clear about it. Surah Ahzab, ayat number 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, An Nabi awla bil mu'mineen min anfusihim. That the Nabi has, is awla. Awla means has more authority than the believers on themselves. Just think about it. The vilayat of Rasulullah on the mu'mineen is supreme. He even has the vilayat on the people more than what they have on themselves. And so Nabi is awla bil mu'mineen min anfusihim. He is supreme there as far as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is concerned. But even that supreme Nabi and Rasul. The same Allah in Surah Al Imran, Ayat 59, says that remember, when you interact with your Ummah, when you deal with your Ummah, remember a few things. Number one, He says, Remember, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ The first thing, remember. It is my mercy on you that you have been lenient with them. Linta is a verb. Layin. The word English also lenient. Probably it comes from the same root. Layin, lenient. You know, and so the first thing uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember, the rahmatin min Allah. Because of the rahmat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have been lenient towards the people. And if, we, if you were not so, min hawlik. They have dispersed away from you. So the first thing is to be lenient. Number two, fa'fu anhum wa staghfir lahum. Pardon them when they, you know, make mistakes. And ask for their forgiveness. Number three, wa shawiruhum fil amr. And consult them in issues. Of course, we are not talking about all issues. You know, you can't have a consultation on halal and haram. You're going to have a majority of the, um, you know, parliament in an Islamic government saying, we are going to make khamr halal today. It doesn't work. There's no consultation in halal and haram. But if something halal is to be done, and maybe there are three ways of doing it. This is where the Prophet is told that if there are different ways of doing the same thing which is allowed, shawiruhum fil amr, then consult them. However, fa'idha adhamta, you as a leader, then you will make the final decision. And when you make the final decision, fatawakkal ala Allah, inna Allah yuhibbul matawakkaleen, then trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the decision that you have made because Allah loves those who Trust, uh, trust him. And so what we see is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one hand has given supreme authority to Nabi over the Ummah. But he's asking him to be lenient, number one. To be, you know, um, pardoning and forgive, uh, forgive them. And to, to consult them. And we see in the seerah of Rasulullah that he used to do this in certain issues, especially when it came to the issue of uh, warfare, whether we fight in the city or go outside, and many things like that. And we have to look at that example. If Rasulullah with his special status over the Ummah is asked to be lenient, to be forgiving, to consult, what about this leader in the family? You don't even have any vilayat anyway. 
you don't have special authority there. But even then, we have to look at the example of Rasulullah. You know, the issue of leniency has to be there. Quran in Surah An-Nisa again says, Ashiruhunna bil ma'roof. You know, interact with them on the basis of goodness, generosity, and kindness. And this is where we have to realize that, you know, Quran says, you know, live with your wife, with your family on the basis of ma'roof. Salawat The sixth imam was asked about the duties of the husband towards the wife. How should he behave with her? Two different narrations by two different individuals who asked the questions. One, he says that his duty is, um, referring to this fellow, he says, forgive her mistakes. In another one, he was talking about a third person, he says, when jahilat, if she makes a mistake, then he forgives. So the issue of pardoning and forgiving is there, even in the position of leadership within the family. And the issue of consulting. Amir al muminin talks about it. He says, remember, Fadari, Fadari hala kulli hal. You know, always um, be amenable to her in interaction with her. And be a good companion to her so that you can have a peaceful life. Your self-interest lies in being kind and good with her. If you really have to have, you know, wayasful aishak. And this is where we see that, you know, when we talk about this position of leadership in a family, remember you are the leader, but she is the deputy leader of the family. Allah says you have to manage the family and you have assigned actually the duties of management of the household to her. So you can't always dictate. You will have to consult her. You have to get her on, on the same page in order to make things more, you know, peaceful and comfortable in, in family life. Salawat But again, I would like to emphasize the point I made last night. Being leader in the family for the husband doesn't mean that the wife coming into that family loses her personality and her individuality. Last, last night I talked about some of the subtle, you know, ways where this is changed because of our culture. And one example I mentioned was the change of the last name. You know, Indira Nehru, born in Nehru family, with marriage she becomes Indira Gandhi. Baba, well, she is not from Gandhi family, she is married into Gandhi family. In, in, in the Muslim culture, at least the cultures which emerged soon after Islam in the Middle Eastern area, you know, women maintain their family um, names. And I gave the example of the wives of Imam Hussain bin Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. Salawat As if to emphasize that point, I think the, uh, the seat is empty there. Instead of sitting there, you can come and sit here. Do we have the groom here? The other one? Not yet? Oh, okay. Salawat from the As if to make that point, it's interesting, the same ayat, the number has not yet changed, where he says, Ar-Rijal qawwamuna ala nisa bima faddal Allahu ba'adhum ala ba'ad wa bima anfaqu min amwalihim. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the wife. And immediately he says, Fas-salihat. He says, the righteous woman. Already at least giving an indication that yes, you are Qayyim. You are the, as the husband, you are the leader of the family. 
But the wife still maintains her individuality. She is still a Muslim, a mu'min, responsible for her life and action in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She will be questioned about whatever she does. And so the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now describes the wife here, he says, the, the wives, he says, فَالصَّالِحَاتِ The first point. That wife in the family could be among the salihat, the righteous ones. A mu'mina or a mu'min uh, or muslima has this potential within her. Nothing to do with her relationship with the husband. Rather, rather as an individual muslima and a mu'mina, she has this potential of attaining higher levels of spirituality. In Surah Ahzab, ayat number 30, 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this point. In a long ayat where he says, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ وَالْخَاشِئِينَ وَالْخَاشِئَاتِ وَالْمُتَصَدِّقِينَ وَالْمُتَصَدِّقَاتِ وَالصَّائِمِينَ وَالصَّائِمَاتِ وَالْحَافِظِينَ فُرُوجُهُمْ وَالْحَافِظَاتِ وَالذَّاكِرِينَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ He says, Verily, Muslim men and Muslim women, believing men and uh, believing women, obedient men, obedient women, truthful men, truthful women, patient men, patient women, Humble men, humble women, charitable men, charitable women, the men who fast and the women who fast, the men who maintain their modesty and chastity and the women who do that, the men who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very often and the women who do that. In all these ten qualities which form the basis of honor and privilege and state and status in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says men and women are equal. In Islam, in Iman, in obedience, in truthfulness, in sabr, in khushu, in, in sadaqah, in fasting, in maintaining their modesty and in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both have the same potential. Maybe sometimes the, the hus husband is higher, but sometimes the wife would be higher. So that doesn't diminish, dim, diminish her personality as far as her status in Islam as a mu'mina and a muslima is concerned. Salawat And then he says the second thing in that family context. And this is where I don't think, you know, all the women will accept it, but it is there. You know, فالصالحات قانطات قانطات means obedient obedient to the leader in the family I didn't hear a salawat from you man here <laughs> but you know what I'll what, what, what say later on Yes, if the husband has been made the head of the family, and if he is the one where things cannot reach to consensus after consultation with one another, he makes the final decision. That position of leadership would have no meaning if there is no following from the other side. The whole issue of leadership means that a time will come when others will have to follow. Otherwise there is no sense in having this. This is where you will have anarchy and chaos in that social unit known as a family. However, and so Quran says, Ar-Rijal qawwamoon ala nisa and then coming on later he says, Fassalihat qanitat. Obedient. They are obedient. But this issue of being obedient to the husband has been severely restricted by the Sharia. Only in two areas. Where it is wajib on the wife to obey the husband. 
Number one, she should not refuse herself without any religious or medical reason. And number two, she will not leave the house without the impl implied or express permission of the husband. And on these two issues, when we talk about the leadership of the husband and the family, and the expectation of obeying him in these two matters, you know, this is unanimous as far as the Shia Fuqaha are concerned. Whether it is the, uh, what they call these days, traditionalist, you know, uh, mushtahideen, or moderate mushtahideen, or the modernist mushtahideen, or even those who are known as reformists. Even let, you know, I mentioned the names yesterday. Ayatullah, late Ayatullah Fadullah, Ayatullah Ibrahim Jannati, and even Ayatullah Sani, who are known as reformists, so-called. Even they agree on this issue. That in these two issues, the wife has to obey the husband. But then, and there is not a third wajib duty on the wife towards the husband. This is where you realize this issue of Qanitat stops there. And this is where we have to realize, you know, everything depends on how you conduct yourself as a leader in the family. Amir al-Mu'mineen, you know, talking about this, he says, remember, إِنَّ الْمَرْأَ رَيْحَانَ وَلَيْسَتْ بِقَحَرْمَانَ A woman is Rayhana. What is Rayhana? Rehana is the name of this, you know, um, aromatic plant, a plant which has good smell and fragrance. Amir al-Mu'min says a woman is delicate. You have to handle her delicately. So you do not suffocate that. You know, you do not kill her in that way. Be, be, be delicate in your interaction with your wife. Laysat biqaharmana, she is not a housekeeper. The word qaharmana, of course in Farsi, qaharman means the wrestler. But this is not Farsi, this is Arabic. She is not a housekeeper. It's very interesting, keep this in mind. This is Amir al-Mu'minin saying, remember the wife is, a, is like an aromatic plant. She is not a housekeeper. And so this is where we have to realize that yes, there is a system in the family. Husband is the head of the family. The wife is the deputy head of the family. And in that relationship, there are two duties that she has to obey. In other things, she is responsible in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for herself. Whom does she follow in taqlid? Does the wife after marriage has to start following the same marja that the husband was following? Huh? No. It's not the right of the husband to force that. It is her religious duty to do what she thinks according to the Sharia principles. You know, and she continues that. You know, when Saddam was removed from uh, power in, in Iraq, and the first democratic elections took place, where even our religious leaders, you know, emphasized on the people to participate. And they said all should go, even men and women. You know, somebody wrote a question which was put on the website of Ayatollah Sistani. And the question was, can the husbands force their wives to go and vote for a specific candidate that they like? The reason I'm bringing this example is because I saw recently in one of the you know, discussions, people get out of control, where there was discussion about some of the jamaats in Europe, whether women are allowed to vote in the election or not. In Toronto, we have this from day one. It's not an issue here. But in Europe, they were discussing, and then somebody, a lady, made a comment, oh, this must be coming from this maraja who want to put down women all the time. Well, this is the answer, lady. When the question went to Ayatollah Sistani, that can a husband force the wife to vote a specific candidate that he supports or his party supports, 
Arthur Lesistani said no. A, le a lady, a woman has absolute right to make her own decision. The candidate that she considers to be worthy for that position or the, that area, she has a right to make her own decision in this matter. And so we have to realize, yes, we believe husband is the leader and the head of the family. But he cannot be authoritarian dic dictator. He has to be a be benevolent leader, you know, build consensus within the family and take the family together forward. Salawat I'm, no, I'm sure you all are thinking then what will happen to the household chores. We are not done yet. Don't worry about it. Salawat from the What I had mentioned till now is basically only the purely legal Shari perspective of family life. But there is another dimension to family life that we many times ignore. And that has to do with the issue of the akhlaqi perspective. Islam is not a religion which only talks about purely Sharia legal issues. In many, many, you know, dimensions of life, you have to look at the akhlaqi perspective and combine together. Yes, the husband is the leader in the family, the wife is a deputy leader, and she has to follow the husband in that way. But then there is an akhlaqi perspective, which is based on that famous ayat from Surah Al-Rum, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً Where Allah says that in every marriage we have placed love and mercy or compassion between the two. That will become the basis of the akhlaqi dimension of marriage. When you put this all together, then you will see things will be done in a manner that you can have sukoon. You can't only go by the legal contract. Otherwise, the marriage will end up more or less like a business, you know, uh, relationship. Only when you combine the legal with the akhlaqi perspective, that is where you will see you will have this true marriage. Where Allah says, لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Where you have sukoon, peace and tranquility in your uh, family life. Salawat from the Akbar. Few weeks ago on, uh, on Friday khutbah, we talked about two kinds of ahkam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two kinds of commandments. One is the tashri'i and one is the taqwini perspective. Tashri'i means the commandments which have come down through the sharia, through the books and the prophets and the anbiya preserved by the a'imma. Taqween means creation. Where there is no written law about it, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings in those commandments in the nature of human beings. You know, let me uh, look at this issue of family life. And this is where we'll see the interaction between tashri' and taqween. For example, you know, when it comes to the birth of a child. A baby is born. Is the mother obliged by the sharia to feed the infant? To breastfeed the infant? According to Sharia, it is not her duty. The husband cannot force. It is the husband's duty to provide even for the infant. Even that means, you know, hiring or engaging a nurse to nurse the baby. Another woman who can feed him. This is the tashri'i perspective. But then you will say, no, how will this work? This is where you have to look at the taqweeni dimension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
There is no law in the Quran or the Sunnah which says when a child is born, it is wajib on the mother to feed the child. Why there is no law? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in most cases has, create the, has created this sentiment and feeling of motherhood in the woman. Even if she is not told by anyone, it is her motherly instinct, even a new mother, even if she was never even told about this before, the nature will take its own place. Doesn't matter whether this woman is urbanite or a villager, educated or ignorant, poor or rich, from the first world or the third world, doesn't matter at all. It is the natural instincts will take its own place. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many places brings things through the taqween and the creation. He doesn't have to put that in words in the sharia. This was to make sure things are done naturally without putting the woman as a slave and a servant of the husband. I don't think there is any mother who would, unless there is a medical reason, would not wish and love to feed her own infant child. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, basically deals with this issue. That this will be done, but not as a duty imposed on her. Rather, according to the sentiments and the feelings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, in the mother. Salawat from the Akbar. So how does this help the husbands as far as the household chores are concerned? Again, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings in this concept of mawadda. When a wife sees that the husband every day is struggling, working hard, so that he can provide for her and her, her children. This is where the instinct will come in. The mawadda that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in her heart will kick in. And she will say, okay, let me help my husband. Not because he says this is my duty, which is not. Not because he is forcing me to do that. Not because the Sharia is saying I must do it. Rather, this is my expression of my love for my husband and my children. And she does that not as a duty, but as a labor of love. And this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically brings in the Shari and the Akhlaqi perspectives all together. Unfortunately, there are people who do not, do not appreciate that and immediately say, oh, Islam is misogynist and this and that and against women. No. Look at the whole picture. And this is where you will see the beauty of the teachings of Islam regarding family life. Salawat from the Akbar. But for that feeling to come in the heart of the wife, the husband has to do something. And that's not command and order, rather appreciate. Appreciate what she does in the family. Many times these things are taken for granted. You know, mother-in-laws and husbands say, yeah, Who told you? Did you marry a cook? Were you marrying a kaharmana? In the words of Amir al and a housekeeper, no. You married a wife. And so when she does something, even if she is new, she doesn't, you know, we're struggling with it. You don't criticize for that. You know, let her learn. She's doing this after, out of her own, you know, sense of mawadda. And the only way you can support that is by appreciating and thanking her for that. 
Let me give you two examples. One is not from this town, so don't worry about it. I rarely give examples of Toronto. I do talk about Toronto somewhere else. The husband and wife both, you know, husband was working and studying at the university. Wife also was studying at the university. One day husband comes and says, you know, I'm going to have a guest. I invited him from dinner, for dinner. And the wife says, I have an assignment tonight. I can't. Can't cook. Becomes angry. He says, okay, I'll get it from outside. Goes outside. Orders out of food. And brings in when the guest is coming in. But the food was ordered just enough for two individuals. For himself and the guest. Is the wife going to cook next time? You know the Sharia laws, she also is reading the Risala. And she will say, I don't have to do anything. You have to prepare things for me now. Life doesn't work that way. And unfortunately, that, well, that was a very simple example, but ended up in divorce later on. And this is where we have to realize that the reform is, remo is required, but among the people, and not in our Sharia and, the, and the, in the faith. People have to reform, understand the true values that Islam has brought. On a positive side, this is Toronto example. We were still in uh, old center there one day after Juma prayers. The people at the office told me there is a lady waiting to see, see you. So I went there, sat down. She was from a Lebanese background and she says, Sayyidina, I would like to thank you. And I knew the family, but I hadn't done, done anything for them. So I said, you know, why, why do you want to thank me? For what? And she said, something very unusual happened last week. So I've been married for many, many years. Every day when my husband comes back from work, I make tea for him. But last, last Friday evening, something unusual happened. When I brought the tea, he turned around and he said, thank you. <laughs> and he says, you know, I've been doing this for so many years, you never thanked me. What happened today? And he says, I had gone to the Juma prayer, Sayyid Rizvi was talking about this issue. And this is the days when Taliban had took, on, or took over Kabul, they closed the women's uh, you know, girls' school. And I was criticizing them and the attitude of the Muslims about the way they treat their wives. And so he said, I heard that and so I thought maybe I should do my part. And so, you know, she was very happy with that. Happy to the extent that she comes with Muslims to thank me for that. You know? So just think about it. A simple thank you. You know, the way I say this many times, you know, that time it was only chai, maybe next time you will get coffee. You say another thank you, might get cappuccino after that. So learn. It's not an issue, you are head of the family, so your um, command, your command doesn't work. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that mawadda in, in, in the heart of the wife. But you are the one who is to nourish that. By your akhlaq and your attitude towards your wife. Salawat al انسان کے اخلاق کی بات ہے اور آج جس شخصیت کے ولادت کا جشن ہم منا رہے ہیں وہ ہمارے لئے واقعاً فیملی لائف میں بھی رول موڈل اور کمپلیٹ اگزامپل ہیں اس لئے کہ آپ اگر دیکھیں انسان کبھی کبھی جو ہے صرف سنگل ڈائمیشنل ایٹیٹیوڈ ہوتا ہے اس کا جناب عباس کو ہم لوگ نورملی کربلا کے حوالے سے جانتے ہیں 
होता यह है कि कभी कुछ लोग जो हैं वो जंग में बड़े बहादुर होते हैं वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग अपना जलाल दिखाते हैं मैदान जंग में फॉर्म होना स्टर्न होना अपना जलाल दिखाना गुस्सा दिखाना ये सब अच्छी बात है लेकिन वही शख्स अगर घर आके वही करे कुछ लोगों की मुश्किल ये होती है कि वो जब गुस्सा होते हैं तो हमेशा गुस्सा होते हैं और हर जगह गुस्सा करते हैं जिंदगी ऐसे नहीं चलती है कमाल इंसान का अखलाक एतबार से यह है कि इंसान मौका महल को देखे जहां खुशी की बात है वहां खुश हो जहां नाराजगी की बात है वहां नाराज हो जहां तारीफ करनी है वहां तारीफ करे जहां तनकीद करनी है नरमी तौर पे तनकीद करे इंसान के कैरेक्टर में अखलाक में वो फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी होनी चाहिए और उसी को हम कमाल कहते खुदा वंद आलम ने सूर्य फत में आयत नंबर 29 में एक मैार दिया है हमें परमाता है मोहम्मद मोहम्मद यानी वो लोग यानी रसूल इस्लाम और वो लोग जो उनके साथ हैं उनके फॉलोवर्स उनके कैरेक्टर क्या है अशिदा वाल कुफार व रोहमा वही उनमें दो ऑपोजिट्स नजर आते हैं अशिदा शदीद रोहमा रहीम यानी वहां फर्म होना स्टर्न होना और दूसरी तरफ जो है सॉफ्ट होना लीनियंट होना दोनों ऑपोजिट्स हैं लेकिन खुदा मंद आलम कहते हैं कि रसूल और उनके मानने वाले वो जब दुश्मन का सामना करते हैं तो शदीद होते हैं फॉर्म लेकिन आपस में जब उन उनका इंटरेक्शन होता है तो वो रहीम होते हैं दे आर सॉफ्ट एंड लीनियन टूर्ड्स वन अनदर और ये वो कमाल है अखलाक का जहां कॉन्ट्रोडिक्शन को आप अपने में जमा करते हैं मौका और महल को देख के इंसान बर्ताव करे कुछ लोग ऐसे होते हैं कि कम्युनिटी के साथ तो बड़े अच्छे हैं माशाला बहुत अच्छा नाम होता है लेकिन घर वाले से जाके पूछे मिसालें देखी गई हैं कि सबके साथ खुश रहते हैं मुस्कुरा से के बात करते हैं पोलाइट होते हैं जहां घर में दाखिल हुए डिक्टेटर बन जाते हैं भाई ये हर वक्त की बात नहीं है आपको हालात को देखना चाहिए एटीट्यूड को देखना चाहिए कमाल इसमें नहीं है कि आप एक ही तरीके को अपनाए कमाल ये है कि मौका महल को देख के मुनासिबत को देख के आप अपने रवैये को अपना है जनाब अब्बास के बारे में क्या है हमारे सब कॉन्शियस में तहत शुआ जो हमारे जो शूर है कि अब्बास बड़े बहादुर थे दलेर थे शजी थे और उसकी वजह से इतफाक से आ, वो जो तस्वुर है हमारे यहां कि अब्बास जो है जलाली है कभी कभी माँ बाप बच्चा ना बच्चे का नाम रखते हैं कहते मौलाना ये मुनासब भी है या एक बड़ा गुस्सा वाला होगा अरे भाई किसने कहा है कि नाम से जो है वो इस तरह से बन जाएगा हाँ अब्बास का माना जो है दर हकीकत यही है वो शख्स जो हमेशा गुस्से वाला चेहरा बना है लेकिन ये नाम था और हम नाम रखते हैं उसकी वजह से नहीं बल्कि शख्सियत की वजह से लिहाजा घबराने की बात नहीं है खैर हमारे यहाँ तो घबराते इतना है कि आज खाना भी नहीं है लेकिन माशाला से सभी लोग आए चौथे इमाम के लिए हम लोगों को न्याज रखना पड़ा है एक्चुअली ताकि मोमिनी ना आए खैर कई साल से हम कहते रहते हैं तो अब वो हक पे वफा अदा हो रहा है लेकिन वो खौफ कम्यूनिटी के दरमियान में जनाब अब्बास के बारे में कि उनका गुस्सा और जलाल भाई वो ठीक है लेकिन वो दुश्मन के सामने अब्बास ने अपना जलाल का मुजाहरा दुश्मन के सामने किया है जब दुश्मन सामने आता है तब वही है वरना अब्बास दर हकीकत जो है अपने गुस्से और इमोशंस के गुलाम नहीं है 
زیارت میں ہم پڑھتے ہیں السلام علیکہ یا عبد الصالح العبد الصالح کسے کہتے ہیں خدا کے نیک بندہ وہ بندہ جو اپنے تمام خواہشات اپنی ترجیحات اپنے پریفرنسز کو فنا کر دیا اس نے امام وقت کی قدمت یعنی اب وہ فیلنگز عباس کی نہیں ہیں جو حسین چاہیں گے وہی ہوگا دشمن کے سامنے شدید اپنوں کے سامنے رحیم اور وہ رویہ جناب عباس کا آپ دیکھیں اس لحاظ سے اور یقین اس معاملے میں یہ جو آیت ہے محمد رسول اللہ والذین معہو اشداء وعلا الكفار ورحمہ وبینہم اس کے ایک پرفیکٹ اگزامپل اور ایمبوڈیمنٹ جو ہیں جناب عباس کے شخصیت کہ دشمن کے سامنے آتے تھے دشمن میں کبھی بھی جرت نہیں تھی عباس کے سامنے لڑے واقعات کربلا میں آپ نے دیکھا ہے کہ عباس جب گئے ہیں نہر القمہ تک مقابلہ نہیں ہوا اس لیے کہ ڈڑتے تھے کسی کی ہمت نہیں تھی کہ عباس کے جلال اور شجاعت کو دیکھ کے سامنے آئے ہاں ان لوگوں نے حملہ کیا ہے لیکن وہ بزدلی کا حملہ تھا پیچھے سوار کیا ہے اگر ان میں کریش تھا اور شجاعت تھی تو سامنے آتے اور اسی میں کمال ہے کہ عباس دشمن کے سامنے تلوار چلائے بغیر دشمن کو اپنے سے دور رکھتے ہیں لیکن وہی عباس جب گھر کے اندر جاتے ہیں بھائی احترام کرتا ہے حسین سے پوچھیں کہ اگر آپ کے دل میں طاقت ہے تو کہاں سے ہے حسین کہیں گے عباس سے ہے زینب سے پوچھیں اگر بھروسے کی بات ہے تو اس بھروسے کی بنیاد کیا ہے بہن کہیں گے عباس سے بچوں سے بھی پوچھیں سکینہ جیسی بچی سے بھی پوچھیں وہ عباس کو غصور نہیں سمجھتے اس لیے کہ عباس جب گھر والوں کے سامنے آتے ہیں تو وہ رحیم ہیں سوفٹ ہیں وہ اون کی طرح ہو جاتے ہیں دشمن کے سامنے فولات کی طرح ہیں اور گھر والوں کے سامنے بالکل اون کی طرح ہو جاتے ہیں ابریشم کی طرح سلک کی طرح نرم ہو جاتے ہیں اس لیے اگر آپ عباس سے پوچھیں کہ ہمارے تمام رشتہ داروں اور چچاؤں میں سب سے فیوریٹ چچا کون ہیں تو اس بچی کے زبان پہ بھی اگر نام آئے گا تو صرف عباس کا آئے گا سلوات پر ایک بار وہی رویہ ہمیں اپنانا ہے جناب عباس کی صیرت کو دیکھتے ہوئے اپنے سلسلے میں اپنے گھر والوں کے سلسلے میں تاکہ ہم جو بھی ہوں باہر کم سے کم جب گھر آتے ہیں تو ہم میں وہ نرمی ہونی چاہیے وہ سوفٹنس ہونی چاہیے اون اور سلک کی طرح دشمن کے سامنے آپ شدید سے شدید بنیں لیکن گھر والوں کے سامنے لینینسی اور نرمی کے ساتھ پیش آئیں خدا مند عالم کی بارگاہ سے دعا ہے خدا مند اس قلیل عباد و قبول فرما ہمارے گناہوں کو بخش دے ہماری توفیقات میں اضافہ فرما امام کی ظہور میں تاجل فرما ربنا تقبل منہ انکنت السمیون علیم